Um, welcome to 52 Living Ideas. I'm very, very excited about today. Uh, this gentleman, Michael Pierce, I've been watching his videos for, I think about three, four years, something like that. And, you know, psyche is very complicated. It's very, very complex, very deep. We know very little about it, you know, as, as humankind, we know very little about it. And as a person, we know even less about it. And it's very easy, it's a very difficult topic. So it's very easy to go wrong. It's very easy to kind of make mistakes and go along all kinds of paths. Um, and what I found is that, you know, in the process of studying it, I found myself returning back to his videos again and again. Now I've been running MBTI meetups in New York. You know, we used to get, you know, I, I, I'm an experimenter. So um, when I discovered these functions, I said, okay, I want to see what functions different people have. So I started doing meetups. I would get like maybe 80 people. I would divide them into groups of four groups. And I would do that in like 30 minutes. I would do a, one experiment, then 30 minutes, another experiment. So I would do it like maybe three or four experiments per meetup by putting different types together and to see what the impact was and uh, learn from it. So it's, it's a topic of great interest to me. So this meetup is going to be unusual, okay? Because normally what, ha what happens is that people present and uh, then there is a Q and A or we have a panel, a um, bunch of people talking. But here what I want to do is that I really feel strongly that Michael Pierce has something fundamental to say about psychological functions and how to think about it. Um, and I, he's just produced a book. Um, now, I'm a big fan of books because, especially for a complex topic, uh, it really, you know, what a book, what a, what a writer can do in a book is that he can sit down and put down all his thoughts, edit it, re-edit it, get all the uh, clarity, get all the references, you know, just make sure everything is communicated fully. And then the reader can go, like, for example, I got this book only two days ago, and I've already read multiple chapters, you know, many chapters three times to kind of figure out exactly with that I get what I'm, what is being said. So that's what you can do in a book, which is hard to do in a video. So I think it's a major step to have it in book form. So what I want to do, um, you know, Michael has been very generous with his time. So he said, I, I was getting scared because I wanted to cover the entire book. I, it originally started as just an interview, but then I, I read the book. I did, I did not expect that I would be able to finish the book in two days, but I was very excited. So I finished the book. So it's kind of partly review of the book, partly interview, and partly making sure that the core ideas are communicated. So I wanted to first cover the book so you get a sense of the whole but i also wanted to make sure that you get the key concepts because some of these concepts are really fundamental and really changes the way you think about everything about psyche okay so uh michael has been very generous he said okay if he can't finish it today then he would come back uh, next saturday for a second part so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to focus on having a conversation with michael to make sure that all the ideas, you know, that you understand, uh, all the ideas are clear. Okay, so first it will be just a conversation between me and Michael, where we'll go through the book. And then we are going to open it up for questions. Then we will do the breakout rooms. And then after the breakout rooms, we'll come back into the main room and share our takeaways. Um, just understand which I, what, what I want to con convey today is the, is the value of the book. And then I would recommend that you go get the book. It is available um, online. It's just four bucks or something like that. And um, the print copy is eight. But I, I recommend getting the online copy right away because you will be able to follow up with this during the week. You can read the book and you can come back and ask Michael questions about it. So that's how I've structured it. So I want to actually make sure that many, many of the, see, the good thing is that there are in this audience people who know this field deeply you know there is richard there is gabe there is nari there is matt it's you know it's just incredible group of group of people here um so i want to communicate i want to i think this is an important addition to the corpus here and i want to make sure that um that is communicated so we're going to go slow we're going to cover the ideas in a very systematic way and that's how 
uh, we're going to do it. Um, so firstly, welcome, Michael. Uh, would you like to say a few words before we bring up the PowerPoint? See, this is very unusual. Normally, interviews are done by just asking questions. I, I had such difficulty to make sure that I was getting everything that I prepared a full-fledged PowerPoint for the interview. So, so Michael, uh, please make uh, some starting comments, and then we can start the interview. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Shrikan. Um, uh, can you all hear me all right? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. I have a, I have a microphone here. Um, I'm, I'm Michael Pierce. Uh, I wrote the book. I actually have it here if you want to see what it looks like. Um, but uh, I'm very proud of it. I've been doing, um, I've, I've been interested in uh, Jungian typology or the MBTI, um, Myers-Briggs personality type for about seven years now. Um, I began doing YouTube videos, I believe about five years ago. And then this book has been um, in heavy production for about three years. So I've just fallen in love with the topic and um, I've found it extremely useful for helping me to sink my teeth into other topics through it, especially philosophy and also literature um, by using some of the concepts I've been able to study. So um, I'm, it's, it's phenomenal to be here. Uh, I, I'm very glad that uh, people have gotten so much out of, out of uh, my work and ideas, and I just like to be able to share my ideas with people. Um, so that's me. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right, I'm going to start uh, the screen share so we can begin the interview. Uh, Michael, can you see the screen? I can. Wonderful. Uh, folks, I recommend that on Zoom, they have a, they have a feature called side-by-side -side view. That is the best way of seeing um, the presentation as well as uh, us as we talk. All right. Um, so let's get started. The name of the book is Mouths and Beams, a Neo-Jungian Theory of Personality. So let me go ahead. All right. So first, I want to start by talking about Michael Pierce's videos. Now there are many, 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 many people who make videos and produce all kinds of material on MBTI. And I have gone through, believe me, I've gone through a lot. And so what is, what is different about his videos? Now we're talking only about his videos. So firstly, my favorite things are the videos that he has done on each of the types. Um, as well as, so what, what I do recommend, this is my standard procedure when somebody says, okay, I've just gotten into uh, MBTI, what should I do? So I have them take a test kind of to get a, because I don't believe in tests that much, uh, to get some sense of where they are strong. And then I ask them to watch a bunch of videos on their functions and a bunch of videos on the possible types that they are. The great thing about these videos is that it is kind of rich multifaceted portrayal. So it's a very deep portrayal of each of the types. So it comes at it from kind of different angles, using different words, different images. So you get this rich portrayal of what this personality type is like. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing, which is actually very unusual, is that he's able to talk about all types and all functions. Now, it may seem very odd, most people cannot because they get so hung up on their type that even when they kind of quote unquote talk about it, they don't have the full appreciation of what it is to be like that. And I find that, you know, uh, Michael has enough empathy um, for types. I mean, that he's able to do that. I remember a friend of mine just said, she was saying, I'm an ESFP and I've not seen anybody understand ESFP is like, like Michael does. So, so that's, that's an example of it. Um, the other thing uh, that I particularly like, because I like the structure, um, the, his conceptualization is very crisp and powerful. Um, in all, I, the, I'm a very visual person, so I'm continuously, um, continuously trying to understand everything um, and I'm trying to kind of reduce items, uh, classify items. And in that process, I found his terms and his way of looking at it 
very powerful. And the final thing I would say, you know, he always ends his videos with uh, young rocks. Uh, uh, but I think that is, that is profoundly true because the thing that separates him is that he has a very deep understanding of Carl Jung's approach, which is very much far richer than the more kind of modern takes, most modern takes on MBTI. So he brings in this rich background to everything that he says. So those are the four things that I find unique about his videos. And when I read the book, I found that he has all those four things. Those things carry over fully into his book. So that's why I'm very excited about the book. So now let's go uh, about the book. So first, first thing that really struck me was your characterization of the book as a love letter to human psyche. Uh, so I, I was really blown away by that because I, I very much identify with that. Um, so please say a little bit more about that. Uh, I, yes, I was going to say, I would add in the caveat that um, it, it is, uh, 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 the way I describe it is a business inquiry that I, I suddenly realize is a love letter halfway through reading, writing it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, and I think the book reads that way. It, I think it has an odd, um, it certainly felt that way while writing it. It, it, uh, like I, well, like I say in the preface, I, I was originally planning on it being a very straightforward, very, um, almost dry intentionally manual. And then, um, it, it, it was actually very strange as I was writing it, especially when I got to the third chapter, it's like, I, I pulled, <laughs> I pulled a young. When you read young, he'll. I feel like he'll start out trying to be very sort of dry and scientific, and then he'll hit on some symbol or idea, and he'll get super excited, and he'll just like fly off into space, <laughs> and just explode. And I feel like I, I was, I kind of do that at points, and I fluctuate between um, poetry and philosophy a bit. Um, so that's that's part of why I characterized it that way. Um, why moats and beams? Uh, because it is a, if, uh, if you're not familiar, it's a reference to the scripture in uh, New Testament in Matthew, and I believe a couple of other places. I actually quote it in one of the first pages. Um, but, uh, and why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Um, it's, it's uh, about hypocrisy and about the, the concept of, um, and you can see it on, on the cover of the book, whenever you're trying to, I've, I've noticed, and one of the reasons I like personality types so much is because it allows you to realize how elements of how other people think and elements of how you think that we take for granted except for those little things that will irritate us and seem to have a lot more going on beneath the surface. And so when I think it's very important to understand what your own prejudices are versus the other person's prejudices. Um, sorry, I keep moving in front of the camera. Um, uh, and so I wanted to tie it in with the New Testament, which is a very important um, book for me, shocking statement. <laughs> And um, I, I uh, um, that, that's why I, <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how else to put it. Wonderful. Um, so you call it a neo-Jungian theory of personality. So say a little bit about the influence Jung has had on your thinking. Uh, from the very beginning, when I first, uh, when I first started studying Myers-Briggs, originally I only knew about um, Myers-Briggs. That was for a little bit. I took the Myers-Briggs test like most people and then really started getting fascinated by wanting to understand not just my type, but the other types. And then I wanted to understand the theory underlying it. Um, and anyway, once I started digging into it, it wasn't long before I, you know, you start hearing about Jung. And so I started trying to study Jung because I wanted to get down to the bottom of these ideas. I've kind of continually been, been driven in studying these ideas by feeling that my knowledge was not sufficient and that there were still contradictions inherent in how I understood it. 
and I was constantly trying to figure out how to work those out. For years, it was exhausting and excruciating, and I'm sure there's still a few contradictions that I have yet to work out, but um, anyway, I, I uh, Jung is sort of at the bottom of it, and I started reading him and have had an interesting relationship um, that has actually grown is almost the opposite of what some people I think have dealt with, where they will start out very adjuvant of Jung and then become disillusioned by some of the faults in his character or, or some of these things because he's human. For me, it was the opposite. For some reason, I went in very skeptical and kind of not trusting. Um, and uh, it's sort of sweetened as I've sort of gotten to know him and read and obviously gotten to know him through the books. But um, uh, so, it, and that I think has shown in the book, which I think actually reads in sort of a much more Jungian way, uh, almost despite myself, so. Um, Wonderful. Um, why Neo-Jungian? So what, what is Neo about uh, your the the theory of personality? Um, well, I wanted to, I didn't want to give the impression that what I was doing was simply, um, was, was simply, uh, what's the word, explicating what Jung has already done. I wanted to make sure people understood and I, I don't believe I'm the first one on the internet to use the term neo-Jungian. I believe Eric Thor is the first one, but I don't know for sure. He makes, he's also someone who makes YouTube videos. But I think it's a very helpful term to describe what me and a lot of others on YouTube and other places have been doing, where we don't want to be tied down by Jung, but we want to um, respect the ideas by being able to build on them and go where we think the theory takes us. Um, so I wanted to designate that, that difference from, from uh, the transcendence of the student from the teacher, as it were. Excellent. Um, so I want to now talk about moving from videos to books. So first, I want to take a few minutes to talk about your videos. So why did you start making videos? And what I mean, what, what is it? I mean, what is the experience of making the videos? How do you capture types in videos? Say something about, you know, how you've used video as a medium. Well, uh, when I first started, it's actually a very interesting story. When I first started studying uh, the Myers-Briggs, I didn't have any, any notion of, I didn't go into it thinking I'm going to make videos about this, certainly not write a book about it or anything. I just wanted to understand it. Um, but I actually, I think I had the same experience a lot of people have had, that there's so much information out there and having to try to sort through that and everybody seeming to be contradicting each other. There's so many different definitions, even though it all seems to be referencing something, the same thing that you can see. Um, eventually, I got to the point that... Um, uh, <laughs> I was, I was frustrated enough by um, how difficult it had been for me to finally get my head wrapped around some of the, the terms and things. And I didn't feel like things were presented in a logical, straightforward way. And so I finally decided, well, if no one else is going to do it, then I might as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I started working out um, doing those very first videos I did, which was the um, uh, lessons in Jungian typology. And then um, and then I almost a little reluctantly started doing the type videos after that. Uh, I was mostly because I'm like, well, you need to understand the foundation. And I wanted to make sure people focused on that. But naturally, the way people go into it is they go into it through the types, and that's fine. Um, so I started making the type videos, and, um, and those just sort of exploded. And, uh, um, and I've, I've just continued continued sharing my ideas ever since. I, I'm very big on, um, I feel like I'm built to try to take things that I don't understand and I have to work through them. And I think I'm fortunate that as I work through them, I'm, I'm able to try to retrace those steps in order to show other people how I, at least I try to work my way through it. So. I feel I'm somewhat entitled to say I think I'm a good explainer because so many people have told me so. So I, at least I have that evidence that I'm a good explainer mm -hmm. of certain things anyway. Um, so yeah. Um, Excellent. Now, how was writing the book different from writing a video? What's, what's the difference for, for you? 
Uh, well, writing, actually writing the videos, I felt I could be somewhat more casual because I knew people weren't going to be reading the script. I would be reading the script and I could even improvise a little bit depending on uh, as I was recording it. But writing the book, they will be reading the script. I actually think I preferred writing the book <laughs> to uh -huh. doing the videos to a certain extent because um, actually e exactly what you had been saying when you introduced this is exactly how I felt while writing it. I'm able to really crystallize the ideas and I'm able to, um, it, it uh, was actually a tremendous learning experience. It's not as though I figured out all of these secrets or whatever and, and then put it down onto the book immediately. No, the writing of the book itself is three quarters of what really helped me to come up with some of these ideas because I have to, when you write, you have to force yourself to realize your own contradictions as you explain it in a logical format and then you have to face them and work them out and rewrite it and rewrite it. So I, I actually think I'm, I prefer writing writing books to videos only because it, it just fits better with how I tend to think about things. I, I can, like I said, I can crystallize them. I can, um, I can sculpt them out. It's, it's a very visceral process for me. Um, I, I also, I, I writing it, um, I write kind of like Michelangelo sculpts, at least according to legend. He, Michelangelo, <laughs> most sculptors would sort of go all the way around and sort of shape the thing, but Michelangelo would have this idea in his head and then he would just go straight through. <laughs> I don't know if that's completely true, but that's how it felt while writing it. I didn't write the last pieces, at least I didn't intentionally write the last pieces. I moved from the first chapter through and I just kept marching, and sometimes I'd go back and rewrite things, but, so anyway, it, it, it um, was a lot like sculpting this thing out of stone. Um, okay, one, yeah. one question that most hmm. writers, uh, you know, think of, three years is a long time, so what, what has it been like, the, the process of writing the book? Oh, well, um, it's, uh, it's been off and on, so it's, it's, it isn't as though I have been like, every day for an hour sitting down and doing this. I've, I've taken breaks and things, and so it's, it's drawn out. But the last year or so has been more or less constant work um, in between my job and stuff. Uh, it's a lot like having, um, I wanted to do it. I wanted to get the ideas out. I found it useful, extremely useful for me to better understand the ideas by, um, like I keep saying, codifying them, that's very important for me. So it's a lot like having a giant block of marble just in the corner of my room <laughs> that I moved mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. And every, you know, whenever I get a chance, I was drawn to it. It wasn't, it wasn't really work for me. I mean, it was work, mm -hmm. but it was work I loved and enjoyed. And that's the only reason this book got done. So it's like, I, um, whenever I had a chance, I would just take out my tools and start working on another <laughs> little bit of it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and, and, uh, eventually I, I got it to a point. Uh, I think one of the biggest boons for me was, um, ironically enough, and I almost hate to say it, but the, the COVID crisis, um, meant that I was just at home. I, I, not only did I not have obligations, uh, outside, but I was basically not allowed to have obligations outside. And I just finished the book. I just sat down for our, most of the day and just hammered out everything in the book. And so that's why, frankly, I think that's why it really did get done and wasn't just continually being worked bit by bit. So, um, yeah. Excellent, excellent. So uh, now let's go into the meat of the book. Uh, so, you know, you called your blog by this name, Subject Object. Oh, yes. um, and I think this is the fundamental insight that you have. And I want people to get it in the fullest way possible. Um, so please, uh, can you talk about this distinction? And then we'll go into the details of it, please. Uh, yeah, well, one of the things I found when writing the book is it was essential in order for me to understand some of these concepts it's not even just essential, it's just what I naturally do. Um, 
I needed to get down to the bottom of what what distinguishes two ideas from each other. So um, the the every time that I would the way that I've always tried to understand um, the concepts in types and also just in Jung is I always prefer to, I, I, I refer to it as trying to understand it logically. That's a very loose use of the term. But by that, whenever somebody posits something, I want to know what the direct, almost logical opposite of it is. So yin yang. And, um, if you if you do that and can do that with anything then that means you could theoretically line everything up into two columns and show sort of the the intuitive connections between things so when i was dealing with these different concepts like extroversion introversion and judgment perception for instance i realized that when i really essentialized them down to what i thought was the the real kernel that you kind of, uh, the bone that you apply the meat onto, um, I realized they were essentially the same thing. They referred back to this subject object distinction that I think is, uh, it sounds almost pompous to me to, to be like, it's as a fundamental structure of existence. It's, it's <laughs> like, but that's what I think. I mean, I, I, that's how I view it, um, is that like I say in the book and also in one of the first things I say in my first video is that in order to for anything in psychology to work you have to have a subject and you have to have an object and I actually think that holds for everything I think that is sort of what makes existence work you you can't just have objects floating in a void because no one is perceiving it um, it doesn't mean anything for anyone. The very fact that you are imagining like meteors floating through space implies there is a subject who is understanding it. So you always have these two and I think they carry certain, I, I always go back to that notion logical and I mean it loosely, but there, there is almost baggage that you always carry with you whenever you introduce these two things. So I think whenever you're dealing with opposites, my my ambition, I suppose, is that whenever dealing with opposites, especially in the book, I always try to see whether how well I can link them up with the original subject object distinction um, and then thereby kind of link it up with other things and get more insight from it. So got it. Now, let me um, let's put that on the table, uh, put put the details of this. In the, so what is the subject and object distinction? Yes. Um, well, I mentioned it a little bit. Uh, the, the basic idea is in order for anything in psychology to work, you have to have a subject who is understanding the stuff and then the object that they are understanding. And um, for instance, the, the, the quote that you brought up is, it, I'm almost resisting the temptation to just bring my book out and start quoting it almost like it's scripture because, <laughs> because it's like I codified it there. But um, it, it, it is, th there's more to it than that, than just that. Some of the details you get from it are um, uh, when, when you are trying to think more objectively, you are trying to erase yourself as an existing perceiving subject in the world for whom th for for whom things happen to you you can't do it entirely but you are trying to become one with the object you are trying to erase yourself in a sense and um uh so that's almost what we mean when we say you are more objective it means that i as another subject can almost trust you more because i don't have to divine what your secret prejudices are and stuff, you've erased those. Whereas the subjective, subjective realm is, is where you focus in on what those prejudices are. And many of those prejudices are actually very useful in getting a deeper understanding of the material. Um, so that's one way of going about it. Um, Feel free okay. to ask me to elaborate in certain ways and that it helps to be guided, yes. you know. So I, I, as, as you're not going to read from your book, I'm going to read from your book. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> so I, I, I found this particular quote uh, to be particularly useful. And then um, I will, I'll tell you about how I think about it and maybe you can comment on it. Absolutely. Um, so 
uh, you say extraversion seeks to align its will with the information received from the object, but introversion seeks to align the information received from the objects with its own will, to abstract an idea from the object and thus repurpose or reinterpret the information in reference to themselves. Extraversion privileges objective factors, while introversion privileges subjective factors. In short, orientation by the object versus orientation by the subject. I really liked your word uh, privilege. You know, what is it that is privileged? So you have both of them operative, but what is it that you privilege? So I have the way in which I have, I've kind of over the years have thought about it in multiple ways. The way I find it most useful to think about introversion and extraversion is introversion as an introvert. I start from myself, like beginning in any cycle, I start from myself, then I go out, get something from, and then it comes back to me and that's where it rests. So it's like a loop for me, which begins with me, goes out to the other and comes back to me. Um, and for the, but for extrovert, it is exactly in the same order. They are also doing a loop. They start with the object. They come inside to do something about it and then come back and rest. So it's the beginning and the end uh, that is that. Uh, so that, that's how I think about it. What do you think? Uh, I, I agree. In fact, in, in, uh, uh, I, I talk a bit about how I really like that way of putting it. In fact, that's, that's, that's how Jung puts it in psychological types when describing the, the two thinking types. It's, it's like a rhythm. The real difference between them, you always have them both, but the, the real difference when dealing with someone of a more extroverted type versus an introverted type or two different processes is the rhythm in which they deal with the subject versus the object when working with it, um, the, the which they begin with when dealing with them. Um, there was something else I was going to say, down here. <laughs> um, to an abstract idea from the end. Yeah, the um, uh, that there there's that that that's right. Um, Another, I, I don't know if I use this metaphor in the book, but it's almost, no, I do, where I talk about Nietzsche briefly, and I talk about his notion of um, the Dionysian versus the Apollonian, and I use that sort of loosely as well, but what I focus on there is introversion is almost like, um, it's almost like a bubble in an ocean, and you have material in the ocean, and then you have material in the bubble. And it's almost like you're having water that is somehow flowing out of the bubble into the ocean and is mixing with this material, the objective material, and then it comes back into uh, the subject and mixes with the subjective material. This is actually biologically how the body basically works. We're always consuming and expelling material. So we're kind of, we're distinct from our environment, but we are also part of it. An alien, you know, and we're shedding skin and all this stuff. An alien who exists on a different time length so that our lives are just like a blink of an eye to it would, would watch as all of these weird mud monsters rise up out of the ground and then kind of are constantly flowing into their environment. For us, we don't see it that way, but it's that cycle. So um, uh, uh, the... Uh, the in the inside for Nietzsche anyway he describes it um, as a dream. Introversion is the you are dreaming things up, and it's it's yours. It's specific to you, um, but it is informed by the environment. But it's it's a lot like dreams. Things from your daily life come in and then take on this very personal character um, that can allow you to understand things in a way that. Um, one of the things Jung points out that I thought was brilliant is that the advantage of introversion is that it is not determined by its local environment. Because although the extrovert will adapt very well to like its little village that it lives in, um, as soon as this giant empire comes in, everything in, in the village will suddenly become irrelevant and they have to completely adapt themselves anew. Whereas the introvert, um, will not have adapted to that immediate locality. They, they may very well have adapted to a more universal locality overall. Um, 
and and not be deceived. So that that's the potential. They might also just adapt to who knows what and be a, a, a village crank, but <laughs> but that's the price you pay. Um, I I really like your um, metaphor about the cell uh, and the ocean yes. uh, for the introvert. I think that's a really beautiful way of putting it. What would be, can you talk about a metaphor for an extrovert? An, an extrovert, and I, I, I suppose I get into this a bit in the third chapter, um, someone who is more, and, and it gets tricky because everybody has these different processes, um, but someone who is, is extroverted would be someone um, for whom the extroverted process shows up more and is more dominant. So that would look like um, it would actually look like if we're using the cell analogy, it, it would start to look as though the cell is, um, the more extroverted they get, the more the cell actually would start to, um, it, would th it would threaten to become one with its environment, which would ultimately mean death. It would mean disillusion into the environment around it because it's adapting so well. Um, so it almost would be too much water or whatever is flowing into the amoeba and it's threatening to burst it. It's, it's, you know, or it's bringing in too much outside material that its own identity becomes to, uh, starts to be in question. The introvert would be the opposite problem. It would refuse to let anything in and would, well, ultimately starve to death, but, um, it would not be adapted to its environment at all and would start to just turn into a little dead chunk. Um, it would dry out, so to speak. That, that would be one metaphorical way to go about it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now let's go to the next one. So here we are going to, oh, sorry. To, okay, there. Spoilers. Yes. All right. So, I mean, one of the biggest thing that I got out of your book was this first table. Uh, that, so please talk about the, this first table. Yes, um, like I was mentioning before, I think you can, you can line these different concepts up. Whenever you have two concepts you've decided are opposites, I will try to line them up with the subject object distinction. So introversion, judgment, connotation, um, what I consider to, to mark them as different is, is this notion that they bring something new to the table that was not there in the environment before. In other words, they bring something from their inside to the table. So judgment, for instance, um, there, there's this notion that you are bringing this judgment and applying it onto things. It's this from the inside moving outward kind of motion. Um, whereas the object is this almost receptive motion. Um, with perception, you are receiving the perception in. I found this to be a useful way for understanding the difference between judgment and perception. I always found and would tend to describe judgment as having this more active character or aggressive character, um, especially when it is, when it is uh, uh, um, actually ag aggressive, that implies too much of, of the, the uh, object. Um, it's this notion of originating from within the self and having, the way I keep thinking about it is it's almost like a concentration. It's like a, a concentrated solution versus a diluted solution when I think about it. Um, so the same thing with connotate, my concept of connotation, which I, I use, as you can see in the second table, as a way to distinguish um, the functions further from each other. Um, that I define basically as reading into a situation. And in order to do that, you have to bring something from inside yourself on, on to it. You have to already have a notion that you can use to read into the context of something. Um, so uh, it, it's always going back to this idea of having this material inherent in you that you are sort of vomiting, for lack of better words, onto the objects uh, and thereby sort of changing them so you can understand them versus receiving the objects as they are into yourself um, and letting them affect you. I talk, I use um, a quote from Ayn Rand where she, she talks about, um, uh, and she's biased in this regard, but she, she talks about how the human is someone 
who adapt their environment to themselves. They are trying to change the things outside of themselves and make the world more like themselves. Whereas the animal, and so you see her bias, um, that she relegates the objective to the animal, but, but for her, the animal adapts itself to the environment. So it changes its own body and will put up with things and will always be listening to what is happening and basically cause its own body to change. Whereas the, the subjective will change the things outside of it. Um, so you see where sort of the privilege is, the, the, the word you mentioned. For the subject, the privilege is, is on the subject, on the you being the thing that isn't going to change. That's the thing that is good. The thing outside of you needs to be changed more into alignment with that. Whereas the object actually means I am not good. I need to change in accord with the environment. So you can start sort of flowing into some of these different ideas. Um, and I do a lot of that in, in the book. I, there's a lot of flowy, <laughs> flowy thoughts. Um, uh, so I uh, just want to let everybody know what we're trying to do is uh, I'm just trying to cover the spine of the book. There is a lot of flesh and you really need all of the flesh to fully grasp it. So I just want to go through the spine to see the, the, the core, core points. Now, this distinction between denotative and connotative is one of the new things that I learned from the book. So please, uh, can you elaborate on that and how it applies? Because Jung had these four functions, right? And you, you are dividing it on, to, on two different axes. So please, uh, could you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I'll talk about how it arose. And I, I, I mentioned in one of the footnotes how it's, it's not, a, not technically my original idea. I mean, I, it, it's original in that I've almost like kind of neo-Jungian, but um, it, it arises naturally because um, Jung posits these four functions, um, but he, he, he sort of, pos it seems he, he posited them, he didn't deduce them. He, he sort of observed them, and what I'm trying to do is show how they, they have this logical deductive character that you can form them in the way I do with the table. In order to do that, uh, it was necessary to say, well, what is the difference, for instance, what is really the difference between sensation and intuition and thinking versus feeling? Um, what is it that, that separates those two? They're both forms of perception, but... Um, and specifically, what are the traits that separate sensation from intuition in the same way that thinking separates from feeling? And, um, and I, I came up with the notion of denotative connotative. The original idea was denotative. Um, it was this notion of the thing is uh, the thing you are sensing um, or that you are basing your, your judgment on is simply given. So you, you get that idea of the object where it is you are receiving it. You're not questioning it. It is, it is a thing that is out there and you are trying to let it change you. Whereas the connotative is you are reading into the thing that is presented. So you are using, that's why it's intuition. You are, you, who knows where it comes from? It comes from inside of you but you are applying these ideas to the thing or feeling you, you have these moral ideas that you're not getting from the environment. Uh, you don't, there aren't um, magical uh, uh, moral wave. Well, I mean, we could get into philosophy and say that there are sort of like secret moral waves that flow through the environment that we sense, but I'm assuming not. It comes from inside of you and is applied to the thing. So um, I, I, pretty quickly linked it up with the subject object distinction I was talking about before. And it's a way to, to show what the difference is between sensation, intuition, thinking, and feeling. Um, so let me try to put it in my own way and tell me whether uh, and, uh, this distinction between denotation and connotation. Um, firstly, I'm ex very excited about it because what it does is that it just establishes these two columns, you know, two ways, and then it uses other things like introversion versus extroversion, judgment versus perception, kinds of perception and judgment as way of doing the same distinction. So I think it's a very powerful way of looking at it. So in terms of denotation and connotation, denotation is that, it's kind of going like that, saying that is the thing. Like for example, in the case of sensation, that is where I'm getting something from. Yes. Whereas connotation, uh, 
or kind of intuition in this sense, its connotation goes like this is somewhere over here. I, I feel that yes. it is somewhere over here. Uh, I, you know, and it's, it it's kind of- It goes around it. It's a, a, around it. So it's like that way versus that way, something like that. That's how yeah. I think it. Okay. Um, so, so I, uh, I think this kind of having this two part division has lots of consequences. So uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. All right, yes. uh, go ahead. Could you explain the, the first one? And then let's start just with the first one. Well, I linked it into the I Ching. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was struck by the I Ching. Well, first of all, because Jung was a fan of the I Ching, so I, I knew a bit about it. But um, when I really started uh, looking through Richard Wilhelm's approach to it, um, Wilhelm and Jung were friends. Um, it struck me how I immediately saw, oh, this is a binary system. There are two options and you just combine, it's like computer programming. You just combine the ones and zeros together and you can literally create an infinite number of combinations um, or you can build infinite things of infinite size so long as you add more of these combinations, but it just starts from two. And, um, I'm like, oh, I wonder which one is the subject and which one is the object and whether there's anything to be gained from that. And um, I think that there is. I think that the the unbroken line in the I Ching tradition, uh, in, in their tradition represents um, what I relate to the subject, almost like this fullness that is overflowing onto the environment. It is this assertion um, you are, you are full up of something. I actually, uh, one way of talking about subject and object that I use is I relate it to the heart or to anything that will receive in the blood and then pump it out. The introverted motion, somewhat different than I think how most people will think of it. I actually relate to the, the pumping out but maybe best to the moment where it is full is introversion and then the natural motion is for it to pump that that internal material onto the environment which is why when you talk with an introvert who is particularly introverted once you get them on what they're really interested in they will vomit all over you <laughs> because they have so much information um uh but uh, uh you can relate it to the heart and i that's what you see with the um with the diagram a bit a bit lower where I, I've stacked it, it has the arrow. Um, I, and and I'll, I, I suppose I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, you, you have the broken line, which is this reception. It's like the doors have opened up, um, almost like the heart valve has opened up. It receives in the supply of blood. It is receiving, it is an objective. It wants to let the object speak and not speak itself. It doesn't want to interrupt the object as it listens um, to it. And so it receives in the material from the outside world, and then those clothes become an unbroken line, and that's the introverted phase where it's processing it and then is also expelling it out onto the environment, if, if that makes sense. Um, so I really liked the idea of, you know, once you, once you, like with the, the diagram from the previous slide, uh, once you link up, say, um, connotative with the subject and introverted with the subject, then yeah, um, or excuse me, judgment with the subject, then you realize that feeling is two unbroken lines. It is the most subjective out of the four options um, because it's, it's the two more subjective traits. Whereas sensation is the most objective because it is both, or receptive, you could say, because it is both perception and denotation. It is simply perceiving what is there. Whereas feeling is a, applying what is, what is not physically there, but is sort of intuited. Um, it is a judgment. So you kind of get, get these polarities. And I found relating it to the I Ching, um, to be a natural, natural step um, because of the binary nature. Okay, uh, I want to make, uh, I want to talk, uh, make a general point here. Um, I think the Chinese way of thinking most naturally respects change and flow between one thing and its opposite. And it does that in a very fundamental way 
in its in the way in which it is conceptualized itself. Whereas the West is more, much more kind of linear uh, kind of a thinking. So I find that where one of the things that I, I found very interesting is that you've kind of, in your approach to functions, you've kind of incorporated that way of thinking, the kind of the Chinese. So you're, uh, Michael, you're Chinese. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, so, so sure. Um, uh, yeah. So what I mean, for example, this, you know, the concept that you have or the wheel of psyche is very much of a Chinese way of thinking about it. How do these things flow into one another? Um, any, any thoughts? Oh, I, I mean, my, I just naturally started doing that, especially as I started, you know, I put them into two binaries and then I just started seeing how easily they flow into each other and rely on each other in order to be understood. And, um, I actually, I actually get a, a worry sometimes that um, in my attempt to pin them down as subject object, uh, I, I've tried very hard to make sure that I don't end up running into contradictions where what I describe as subject, I'll sometimes flow too much into describing the object or I'll flow too much the other way because they depend on each other. And um, it's very flowy. It's very... Um, uh, it's, it's the notion of sort of the paradox of opposites that you, well, you get in Heraclitus, um, the ancient Greek philosopher, that um, the way up and the way down are the same way. It's the same road. So you have this interesting thing where you have um, two poles on the same, on the same bar. Uh, uh, and so like in... Um, I talk about the wheel of the psyche because of this notion of the things turning into each other. So for example, with um, <laughs> I, uh, another thing I do in the book in the first chapter is I relate sensation, intuition, feeling, and thinking to the four noble truths of Buddhism, um, which uh, I, I, f I found to be another very interesting way of, I'd actually done that before no, I think I had started writing the book at that point, but I'd done it a while back, but then I brought it back in, where um, the Four Noble Truths, to me, seem to be a, a, a basic pro progression that I think mirrors the progression of the, um, of the four functions, where sensation, you, um, and uh, I will reference the book here, because I'll put things down in, in writing, and then my brain will will say, now I'll move on to the next thing. But, and I have trouble, I have trouble remembering it perfectly. But yeah, so the, the first truth, Dhaka, um, I can remember that one and pronounce it, I believe, um, is simply, it's simply the sensation of suffering, of, of the nature of the world. And then from there you intuit what is causing that suffering then you decide this is something that needs to be stopped, and then you determine via thinking how you are going to actually stop it. And so you have this motion, um, which I call the, the quote, natural direction that the wheel turns, and you get the, uh, the heart, sorry, I keep pointing in front of the camera, you get the, the heartbeat thing that I found there, which, I mean, when I first was like, wait, it's a heartbeat oh my gosh, it's like Illuminati confirmed. And it's like, well, calm down. It's just, it's because you're working with binaries. Like you only have like two things. Of course, you're going to see patterns like this. And, um, uh, you know, and you see it throughout, throughout nature um, because it, that, that's just how the number two works in a sense. So um, does, it, does that make sense? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, that's excellent. Uh, let me go ahead. I'm going to skip one of the slides sure. and go to the, uh, talking of flow, I would rather talk about this first go ahead yeah <laughs> this is my i actually think this is my favorite chapter i think i had the most fun writing it um though i i also think it's where i i deviate the most from from strictly talking about typology but um yeah i i think relating it to the subject and the object i find you can relate it to a lot of things in philosophy where i just as i was reading all my books i have like a whole kind of library i've i've shoved into my room over the years um i just start seeing i started seeing these um 
these sort of two ideas every time that a philosopher or somebody tried to very naturally distinguish one thing from its opposite in order to understand the world better. And it's like, oh, well, I can connect subject with this one and object with this one. So you have yin yang, dark, bright, no, yes, subject, object. I relate it to the, I, I, I try to insist that whenever I'm talking about the feminine and the masculine, I'm speaking archetypally. I, I, because I have strong feelings about, um, uh, uh, I try to distinguish it from actual individuals. In fact, I talk in that chapter about, um, excuse me, uh, uh, about how ev every man has, has uh, feminine elements in them and every woman has masculine elements and they, they, they have them in together and they need to unite them within themselves and then also unite with uh, in order to unite with another person properly. But, um, you know, I, I, um, the notion of the feminine being related to the objective motion is because of the receptive motion, um, which I relate to, um, one of the things I found when doing the book that I, I, I think might be controversial is I somewhat flip a little bit the traditional way that people think about the feminine and versus masculine when often people will and maybe i'm wrong but often people will relate the feminine to chaos and the masculine to order and i don't at least in in my researches i don't think that that's certainly not how i conceive of the object and the subject i actually think that um I think of the feminine as actually being the nurturative order that almost like the physical body that houses the more chaotic masculine spirit. Chaotic in the sense that, say, water is chaotic where it flows. Um, and uh, uh, you can't always tell exactly where it's going to go. It's always moving and, and shifting and shaping. And so I relate it almost more to spirit, to energy. Whereas the feminine, because it is more um, receptive, it, it has this notion of providing the, the, the firm channels that guide that masculine energy. So I like the notion of a tree, for instance, that you have the physical Aristotelian form of the tree versus the, the, um, the destiny of the tree that is growing up through these structures that are inherent in it and forming the tree. And so you always have to have both of them together for there to be life, for there to be creation. So those are some of the ideas I, I play with in the chapter. Um, okay, um, what I want to do now is mm -hmm. I want to take, uh, we are more than one hour, uh, we're about oh, an okay. hour into uh, the interview. I want to give a chance for people to respond because this is like a, natural stopping point and then we have got these slides on function axes uh, four temperaments and 16 types um, but these are the these are the kind of foundations and then we'll go into that so i want to give a chance for people to ask questions at this point Absolutely. so folks uh if you want to um to ask questions you can do it in three different ways um uh, you know you can either type a question in the chat you can put an exclamation mark in chat, or you can raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, there are lots of people here and with lots of interesting questions. We have four rules that we have used for the past four years. We're going to stick to those. First, you have to raise your hand. You can do that by asking a question in the following ways. Rule number two, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. Um, please ask questions. Don't make statements. We, I want to get to as many people as possible. So please ask brief questions. Number four, be courteous. Feel free to be very candid. Feel free to disagree with anything, but do so in a courteous way. Okay, so it's going to be uh, Bob next, followed by Gib. Bob, go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I will need to, okay, because of uh, security reasons, I have to unmute you before uh, that. So let's see, Bob. Bob, go ahead. Um, hi, Michael. Uh, I wonder if you'd be interested in this. Uh, by the way, I uh, have your book on order. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm currently uh, writing an essay on... Oh, Bob, Bob, please ask a question, okay? I will. I, give okay. me a chance. 
I'm currently writing an essay on the foundation of cognitive functions, the foundation. Would you be interested in seeing it? Sure, absolutely. Send, okay. you know, send, send it to my, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do, do you want my email right now or? Uh, uh, I think uh, I found it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, just send it over there, no problem. Thanks. Wonderful, uh, next one up is Gib. Gib, go ahead, uh, Gib, Gib, just a second, let me unmute you. Go ahead. I was just uh, curious if you, if you considered Jung's uh, ideas around logos and eros when uh, conceiving of the masculine and feminine typology. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, when I was writing the book, I did not. <laughs> and it was only after I had published it that I, I began running more into that because I, I've become, um, uh, uh, just from the things I've been reading, in terms of how I would relate it, relate it in, when writing the book, my first instinct would have been to try to reverse them and actually say that um, that logos is the feminine and eros is the masculine. I'd actually back away from that. I think that's oversimplifying and me getting a little too zealous with trying to subvert things. What I mean, though, when I when I say that is simply that uh, I what I had mentioned before that. I am thinking of logos as this um, almost like uh, like dry, dry stalks, dry wood. It's firm, it's straight structure that you build. And then the content is then, which is much more watery or flowy, you have running through those structures. And I relate that more to arrows. So, but looking the young, I, I also see that the way that that he approaches some of these notions is somewhat, maybe somewhat different, and I don't want to jump too quickly. I hope that answers the question. Or uh, thank you, thank you. Next one up is Jan. Jan, give me just a second. Yes, Jan, go ahead. Hi, I was just wondering if you think that the introvert experiences talking on the telephone different than the extrovert. Uh, for example, I have an extroverted friend and I feel like she loses a sense of who I am because she can't see me. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, I, I don't know for sure, but um, that, that is fascinating because that would certainly imply that um, there's something about she needing to, and I think I've seen that a bit, that when people are more extroverted, they, they want to have um, an actual person there. They want to have the object more clearly there for them to work with. Um, I, would, I would hesitate to, to any firmly say, this is something you can test people on if they feel that way over the phone, they are definitely an extrovert. But I think it's an interesting observation, certainly. Okay, uh, next one up is Christine. Christine, go ahead. Um, hi, so I want to ask, how has your perception of the functions and types um, changed since you started to write the book? Because I've watched your YouTube videos and I'm interested to see if there's anything new that you've learned throughout your experience writing your book. I would say that the the essential foundation has remained unchanged, but, um, and it's difficult to, for me to track, unfortunately. Um, not that I want to, to be saying, um, well, if you want to have my more information, you have to buy my book. I, <laughs> I don't wanna say that, but I do think there have been, there's definitely been development, especially through my, my writing the book. I think, for instance, I think that, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, for instance, in the videos, I think I emphasized the notion of, say, NE as being highly scatterbrained. I think in places I overemphasized that. In the book, I tried to hook that more into what I think is a stronger concept, where it's this peer review notion. It's trying to receive in lots of different ideas from different areas. Um, so there, there's, there's changes like that, but it, I don't think it's as though um, I, I, um, 
it's it's not as though I'm like I was completely wrong in the videos at any point, um, but I have definitely developed my ideas by doing the book. Yeah. Next one up is Nari. Nari, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. So I am a huge fan. I love. Oh, thank you. you know, <laughs> I, I love your explanations on types. Um, and one of the things is when I'm talking about types to people and trying to break down the cognitive functions, I feel like, like I have a hard time explaining my inferior function <laughs> as well as like polar functions. I like if you ask me about TI, it's just a big blank. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. how are you able to get such a such a grounded understanding of yours? Uh, I'll say one or two things. Um, first of all, I think I have the advantage in that I am writing a book or writing scripts for a video. I have similar problems when trying to explain things in real time that I've really had to develop. I'll get nervous and, and things will slip up. That being said, um, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of practice and really trying to think through the concepts and also um, uh, practicing explaining it to people. What, what type do you relate to, by the way, just out of curiosity? Uh, oh. Just a second. Wait, 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 oh, no. wait. I think, I think she unmuted oh, her, sorry. Uh, muted herself. That's fine. That's fine. I messed up your uh, flow. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm an ESFP, so oh. NI oh, okay. is really, really terrible for me. And then TI, I, it's just this abstract concept that I can't even begin to define. Yeah, it's um, it. I had the hardest time figuring out how to describe SSI, and I think I still struggle a bit because for me, I find that to be very foreign. Um, I don't want to babble on too long because I don't think I have a firm answer, but, um, but I would say it, it takes thinking about it and trying to observe um, other people who maybe seem to have TI higher up and trying to pay attention to what are the things that they do that you really just don't get and that you've seen in other people, it's not just them. And, um, and you, you know, that maybe even cause responses in you. As, as an ESFP, the prediction would be that manifestations of TI would be odd, foreign, or you, you um, uh, even irritating <laughs> and frustrating. <laughs> and just like, why are you doing that? I don't want to go on too long, but I, I have, um, <laughs> we have a family friend who, is very, very ESFP, very much the archetype, you know, no mitigation at all. And he, he and my father is a TI dominant and they're friends, but it's fascinating seeing their interaction because I remember one time my father getting so, he was so angry with them because the ESFP friend was like, we're gonna go do this thing, okay? I'm so excited we're gonna do this thing. There was no, there was no, TI restraint and my father was like we need to think about this more you're 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 leaping into it that, that's a very broad sketch but I hope that helps anyway um, uh, thank you uh, Michael next up is David David go ahead thanks hi Michael so, hey. so, uh, I was curious about I don't know how much you know about psychology and, and dissociation I was curious about your, your comments about introversion and dreams and dissociation is often thought of as a type of dreaming, daydreaming, and this subjective feeling of being not connected to the world, if there was, had you had any comments about that? Uh, I, I do, I think. Um, I would say, I would assume there would be a, a connection. Um, though I have seen, I think, what I would say is that the different types um, are ordered stacks of, of different introverted and extroverted processes. So someone who would technically be called an extrovert, say an ENTP, does still have the, the TI there and could still have dissociative um, uh, uh, symptoms, you could say. Um, but I would definitely say absolutely. Um, in fact, I... I um, uh, I think I've struggled with that at times, actually. I have a very powerful imagination and um, I've, uh, I've had to learn how to properly relate to that. Um, 
and it's very helpful to be able to continue the flow and not get too caught up in just my own mind. And so it does feel like the dis dissociation could be described as this over introversion and not flowing enough, you know, um, people who, uh, or in my experience, getting too isolated from other people and just coming up with my own ideas that are 100% mine and have no relation and not talking with other people can actually become poisonous. It's like mold, it'll start to, to, to rankle. And it's very, I think the channel actually was very helpful for saying, now I'm forcing myself to hear other people actually tell me, no, that's stupid, that's brilliant, that's this, and, and it helps to you know break up. I don't know if that helps. Um, those are just off the cuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks, um, please keep asking questions in the chat or raising your hand. Uh, it's going to be Steve uh, and then Daniela and Faizan next. Steve, go ahead. Hey, Mike, big fan. I appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Um, so my question is about type changes and function changes and their correlation. So for me personally, I've traditionally been an INTJ. And then one day I met my friend Matt, who's here, who basically told me you couldn't possibly be an INTJ. So I took the test and, and it turns out I was an ENTP and I've tested that way ever since. And, you know, I've done a lot of contemplating as to why I think that is. And as far as I can tell, my I to E is strongly associated with my J to P. And I'm so glad that you said that the judging function is something that comes out of you out of the subject onto the object, and that the perceiving is something that tends to come from the object into you, the subject. And I think a lot of it for me was everything from like Spinoza to neuropsychology and genetics, and just kind of learning that people tend to be what they are and can't really help their functions and their types. When I realized that, I became a lot less judgmental and more perceiving. And the more perceiving I became, the more I found it, I went from like tolerating social interaction to preferring it. So what is your experience with people changing types in general? And have you noticed an association between particular function changes and then the change to, of types overall? Um, this is a good question. Uh, the, I, this is actually uh, something I've I've had to think about since I first started started um, reading about about MBTI and and stuff is whether people change type. Um, a few things I'll say is I am completely open to that possibility if if only because um, there's there's no way for it's not like I can look into your head and see the magical like it says INFJ on your brain or something and. I, and it's like, no, the words are changing. I don't see that. So there's there's no way to confirm whether or not it's, oh, well, you were really an ENTP all along, but you were more repressed or something. I don't know, because people's personalities certainly change, whether or not um, it's, you know, whatever the metaphysical type is that's changing, actually kind of becomes irrelevant because, um, well, maybe not irrelevant, but it's the way you, you describe your yourself. I have noticed, in fact, um, and maybe this is a little depressing, but um, I, I have a couple of friends who went through some experiences that were, were traumatic, and one of the things you see with post-traumatic stress is some changes in personality. And it's unclear in those cases whether or not it's simply another aspect of them that was always there coming more to the fore, or if something has more radically changed, but I, I did see a change in one friend who was originally much more of a feeling type. And after this experience, they actually became much oddly strategic in their thinking at times. It was very interesting. Um, so I, I, I hope that helps. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next up is uh, Daniela. Daniela, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try to stick just to two. Okay. So the first one is that I have read uh, the book uh, Gifts Differing from Isabel Myers. And in that book, uh, from what I understood, what is said about perception and judgment is that they relate to whatever it is, the dominant extroverted function of the type. And, and not they're not functions 
uh, functions by themselves, as you can see, for example, in the 16 personalities test. So my, what the, my first question is, in your book, how do you treat uh, the judging and perceiving? Is it the, how it says in the, in the gifts, gifts differing book or is it not? And the second one is, what is the most reliable way to test your cognitive functions? We have a lot of tests in the internet, and I've done a few of them um, with interesting results. So I would, I just, uh, do you recommend any specifically? Thank you. No problem. Um, for the first question, uh, yes, I, I believe I do uh, uh, approach it a bit differently from Isabel Myers, but it's still derivative. Um, the, the way I approach it is that I, rather than talking strictly about the, um, the four dichotomies that Isabel Myers uh, uses, I talk about the cognitive functions and the cognitive functions are built out of the, um, some of the, the dichotomies. So for example, the um, uh, extroverted intuition, for instance, would be uh, perception combined with my notion of the connotative. So that forms the intuition. And then you add an extroversion and you get this cognitive function. And then you stack those on each other. Um, the relation to the Myers-Briggs types can sometimes be confusing to people because um, uh, it's, it, it's almost like you kind of have to do a, a little bit of a conversion table between, you know, say, say there's a type that's INFP. Um, well, the dominant function for the INFP is actually a judging function, but Myers referred to the INFP as a perceive as more of a perceiving type because their judgment was introverted and wouldn't show up as much when trying to test it um, objectively. One of the one of the uh, great benefits, I think, or the great insights Myers had was having the courage, basically, um, uh, to excuse me to actually go against what people had said that, no, you can't form any kind of objective test and at least try to say, no, I think we can isolate some almost more objective features that we can then test for. And um, I actually think that, that you can link up the big five, which is praised by all of the psychologists, directly up with the MBTI. And I get irritated when they don't do that. But that's a separate question. Um, as for your second question about tests, Unfortunately, I, I can't in good conscience offer any. I can put a plug in for IDR labs, but um, I, I, because I, I feel they're very insightful and I learned a lot from them, um, but um, I don't have anything other than my good will and feelings towards them to, to back that, that up, unfortunately. I think that in the end, most tests will, will do in the sense as long as they are treated as indicators. And that can be frustrating because for people who are unsure about their type, they'll constantly flip-flop, I don't know who I am. <laughs> um, but it can at least give you a, a direction to uh, begin trying to look into it. Um, I've always had trouble answering that question because I had the odd experience of as soon as I started reading my description, I'm like, that's it? I that's, that's, I know it's it. I've rarely, I don't think I've ever struggled with uh, wondering what my type is. So unfortunately, I, I, I feel like most of my advice in that area will be, um, will be indirect. But anyway, I hope that helps. Next question is from Faizan. Faizan, go ahead. Hi. Um, well, first, uh, Michael, uh, I find your videos very insightful and, um, and very clear. Thank you. So, you know, thank you, thank you uh, for all of that. Um, I, so I'm a psychiatrist and, and an INFP and when I, the more I learn about the functions, the more I try to think about how to apply them to, uh, to, to some, some of the things that, that we treat. And I think one of the most nebulous concepts that we always run up against is neurosis and anxiety. Um, and I know that's, it's, it's a very uh like, like i said nebulous but i think for my question for you would be um do you uh do you find any kind of correlation uh between um introversion and the concept of sensitivity because uh 
I know Carl Jung had this concept of innate sensitiveness, which uh, which would imply that those who are exposed to trauma uh, or high stress um, uh, would. Um, would develop differently and their cognitive functions I think would develop differently compared to someone who perhaps is not as sensitive which I think has traditionally been associated more with extroversion but I wanted to get uh, yeah your perspective on that is there any relationship between anxiety sensitivity and introversion or extroversion um it is it is tempting for me to say um and I think there is a there is a perception that perhaps I I myself am tempted to fall into where the there's the notion of um, uh, where introversion is where all of the anxiety lays and where all of the angst lays and I am the angsty introvert and um, I, <laughs> and I think there is something there there is something that you. I, I, you meet a lot of people and it seems to be their introverted side certainly seems to hold a lot of that. And people who are introverts will often feel that there's something about, there is a connection between the two. But um, I, I have some, some people who I consider more extroverted in my family and they, they experience just as much anxiety and, and difficulties as everyone else. It, um, I, I, and I, I think as far as sensitivity goes, um, everybody has a more introverted side. And so um, there's, as I think Carl Jung said, um, there's no such thing as a pure introvert or pure extrovert. You always have them mixing together. And so, um, yeah, to, to be perfectly honest, I, I, I think that um, anxiety, you find it just as much in, in extroverts and introverts. And um, you might see it manifest a bit in different ways. Um, and I think you might also find that people who are strongly extroverted, while they'll have anxiety, they, they will deny it more or be less in touch with it. And it will take on a more unconscious character. And uh, it, you have to maybe approach it in a different way. With an introvert, you can just almost just talk with them to some degree about it. Um, with an extrovert, they might be more in denial. Maybe not, but I'm also not a tra trained psych psychiatrist or... Uh, you said psychiatrist, I believe. Um, yes. I, yeah, that's very impressive, by the way. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. But I, you know, that's exactly what you were just talking about. Is the kind of thing I think about a lot. Is is there a way to to um, like the different kind of cognitive functions? I feel they man manifest anxiety in particular ways, just as you know, you you already started alluding to, and that was really my original question was. Do you, oh, okay. have you found, like, yeah, do you feel as if, uh, or have you noticed any kind of pattern uh, in terms of that, in terms of uh, how cognitive functions manifest or relate to anxiety? Um, I don't think I could say for sure at this point, um, but I do think, I do think there are, there are patterns that you could find. Um, I, th I, I would guess, for instance, I don't know, but I would guess that uh, introverted intuition, um, people who have that will, will, when you talk with them, there will be so much in their brain that will kind of vomit out, and there will be all these different associations. Someone who has extroverted feeling, you'll find that the anxiety attaches more to their relationships with people. So-and-so said this, so-and-so wants me to do this, I can't say no. So things like that, perhaps, but I couldn't say for certain. Okay. The next question is from James. James, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, do you find that your theory um, lines up with, um, you know, uh, the more modern um, cognitive theories? You know, um, do you see an overlap or do you, do you see a consistency with those uh, cognitive theories? Um. If, if uh, I, I am not uh, very well trained in those, if there is a connection, I would be happy to, to know what it is, but I, I fear I don't, I don't think I, I'm qualified to say. Um, I have up to this point generally thought of my ideas in isolation from, from many of the psychological concepts um, that are more modern. Um, and so I don't know 
to what degree there is there is a correlation. Um, so I, I hope that helps, or rather tells you that I can't help. <laughs> okay. uh, next question, uh, last question is from Adrian, and then we're going to go into breakout rooms. So we're going to, uh, we'll have 30 minutes to discuss what we learned from it. And then we're going to come back into this main room and everybody will get to talk about their takeaways uh, from today's meetup. Uh, and also remember that you can follow up, you know, I put the link for the, um, the uh, electronic book in the chat so you can get the book and we can do the re repeat of questions uh, you can ask whatever questions you have uh, next week all right and so I, I will question. say uh, okay. sorry I will say about the electronic book um, the way it'll work is um, and I apologize that it's a it's a little clunky but you will go to PayPal pay for it and I'll see the electronic receipt and I will send you the book as soon as possible so I do apologize it's a little it's it's not as, uh, I, I, anyway, I, I apologize if there's a bit of an hour delay, but just so you know beforehand um, that, that that's how I've been. Yeah, it, it'll be a couple of hours in this case, you know, once you order the book, I want him to kind of, because he's going to stay on for the, uh, oh, the yeah, next, well, next meetup. Yeah. So, so this evening you will you'll get it. Okay. All right, uh, folks. Uh, so, so the next one up is Adrian. Give me just a second. Okay, go ahead, Adrian. Okay, um, so very often for the beginner, uh, MBTI and cognitive functions can feel like an, an alphabet soup of acronyms. I was wondering uh, if you have a convenient way to remember and distinguish the 16 types without having to pull out a notepad every time or consult a reference uh, book. Um, uh, let me let me let me add. Oh, yeah. let, let's <laughs> ho let's hold that for let's hold that for next time because next time we are going to focus fully on the 16 types in great amount of detail and we'll take that question. Sure. Uh, at that time. Adrian, I'll remember that you asked the question. I'll give you the first opportunity of asking that question next time, next Saturday, okay? I will say as, a, as just a little, a little taste um, that there's a lovely chart and we'll talk about it next time. Um, when I first started out though, I mean, uh, I did end up just having to memorize it, but we'll, we'll talk more about it next time. Um, Sounds good. All right, folks, so now it's time to go to the breakout rooms um, and it is there set for exactly 30 minutes. You'll get a two minute warning and then we'll be back here and we'll be talking about our takeaways. All right, folks, welcome back. Um, so this section is going to be about takeaways. What are you walking, with, walking away with? What are your takeaways? I've put the link to the book back again. So I'm just going to go in order in which I see people on the screen and um, just, uh, just brief takeaways, you know, one, two, you know, about how much time do we have? We have, yeah, about, about one to two minutes each. What did you get from, from the presentation? So I'm going to start with Becky. So it's going to be Becky, Shirley, Nari first. Becky, go ahead. So for those who are confused about their type, there are two very good questions to ask yourself. What were my early childhood activities? Um, and what do I do now? Okay. Um, Shirley, uh, just a second. Let me I have to unmute everybody on sequentially. Uh, Shirley, go ahead. What were your takeaways from the presentation and the discussion? Um, well, I, it was really nice having the breakout room. I, I really liked talking to people of like different personalities. And I felt like I learned a lot from how everyone processes like information differently. Um, I think I would say like, one thing that I noticed is like, a lot of us, even though like we have, we took these tests, a lot of us can still be like pretty unsure of exactly like if this is who I am <laughs> and um, it's 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 something that I notice is like a seems like a universal struggle among amongst all of us but um, mainly my takeaway is that like we are continuously striving to understand who we are. Excellent. Uh, Nari, you're next. Uh, definitely just the idea that type is a very involved and intense discussion like I I don't think you'll ever stop learning about it. So yeah, like conversations just kind of help further develop 
your own theory of it. Okay, so it's going to be Melanie followed by uh, Bob followed by Gib. Melanie, go ahead. Nope, okay, so the next one up is a uh, Bob. Let me go ahead and unmute you. Bob, go ahead. Please uh, keep it brief. I'm cool. Yeah. I'm cool. I'm okay, looking forward to the, I'm looking forward to the hard copy of the book. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, next one up is Gib. Gib, go ahead. Uh, I just enjoy the presentation, so thank you so much for joining us. Okay, next one up is uh, Tova, Tova, and then Faizan and Daniela. Tova, go ahead. Um, I just uh, realized that I don't know anything, um, and now I know that I don't know anything. Uh, so I thank you for that, because like it's going to be a fun journey now to process all of this. So um, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next one up is uh, Faizan. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I will say, yeah, one of my takeaways is that I definitely whenever you talk to someone uh, to try to get advice or try to understand something about yourself, remember that they'll, they'll almost always be speaking from their type. So their advice will most likely apply best to their type, which might be helpful to you, but may not necessarily apply to you directly. Uh, so the most useful thing is to help learn the difference between your perspective and other people's perspectives and, and fostering empathy. Um, I think that's the best application for, for and the best point. You know, that, that's the reason why I'm uh, interested in this. And I hope that you guys will be able to, to use it for that, uh, to help foster your empathy as well. Thank you. Next one up is Daniela. My takeaway is that learning is fun learning is great i love information i love reading and i can't wait to read the book because i'm curious thank you okay uh next one up is uh let me see al give me a second al go ahead al any thoughts okay uh let me go to next one is eric eric what were your takeaways yeah, it's very good. I always love seeing these things broken down. It, it really need, need this, sometimes it's hard to wrap your, your brain around. Like when I first started learning what these these uh, dichotomy, these uh, dynamics were, so it's always nice to see um see this see it broken down, especially now if it's if if those four groups he mentioned, the monarchy, if those are the, the groups sharing the same functions, then I'm really interested because um we really that's something I've always said we really need we need it articulated because you know, um, it's really needed outline, you know, it's kind of like the quadrants of Sophia's. So I wanted to ask him if that's what those were. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, there's already, somebody already has like a model of that out there for Western <laughs> right? but said, that's who hasn't caught on. So yeah, I'm, so I'm really in looking at his chapters, I'm really interested in, in, in the book. Absolutely. So uh, Eric, it would be great if you can uh, read the book before uh, next Saturday and come back and ask more questions because we're going to do a follow up on, oh. on the Saturday. All right, awesome. wonderful. Uh, Dave, you're next. Yes, and thank you, Michael. Great presentation. And I appreciate that, yeah, you didn't uh, like one uh, type over another. I'm definitely looking forward to going and looking at mine. We all talked about uh, it could be a useful tool, but uh, Shukran, I tried. And it was interesting. I thought some of the uh, questions were kind of subjective or uh, and on a sliding scale, and people were talking about, you know, realizing that and sometimes manipulating the results, you know, if you try to get employed or something like that. But uh, and all in all, I think we all appreciate it for, for self-growth. Thank you, and I look forward to reading the book. Next one up is Steve. So it's going to be Steve, James, and Matt next. Steve. Yes, yeah, so um, I think my big takeaway was the geometric application to types and functions. Uh, ironically, um, I believe you, Michael, share a type with Spinoza. And, you know, I always thought geometry was useless for anything unless you were getting ready to build something until I ran into Spinoza and then got into Euclid derivatively from Spinoza. So anytime I can see a uh, geometric presentation on something that's abstract and metaphysical, I appreciate it. So your connection between the types functions in each chain was um, enlightening. Thank you. I, I do think I have share affinities with Spinoza. 
and uh, and Plato. I saw that when doing the book. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one up. Next one up is uh, James. James, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion about the, um, you know, um, the um, how this uh, Jungian theory can be used. Um, and some people mentioned, um, you know, uh, comparing it to other theories of psychology and and even astrology. So uh, whatever is uh, useful for, you know, for understanding the self and others would be useful. But we also don't want to get lost in, the, you know, in the, in ideas that are not, you know, relevant or or really um, gets away from the truth value of any any theory or any kind of understanding. Okay. Our next one is Matt. Matt, go ahead. Oh yeah, um, nothing I haven't said already in the uh, the breakaway conversations, but uh, very interesting presentation, Michael. I'm looking forward to reading the book and uh, great uh, breakaway conversations we had. So thanks, Shrikant. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Next one up is Arun. Arun, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, go ahead. Well, I'm sort of a, sort of an outsider to this uh, this body of knowledge, but this session has been very enlightening for me. I come as an outsider, but it's very interesting and intriguing for me to uh, try to understand how behavior patterns and personalities can be predicted by observing and segmenting them into uh, what we're discussing right now. Well, I, I, was, I was more of, an, of a listener in the breakout room because I'm starting off, so I probably I don't have a point of view on this, but, but I... So go ahead. Yeah, but, but thank you very much. For the yeah, session I mean, today. We, we always try to make everything accessible and useful to know, uh, you know, to somebody who is a beginner at the same time, one who is really, really good at something. So the whole yeah. format is designed for that. So really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, next one up is Mad Madeline. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you to the presenter. I've enjoyed it all very much. Uh, I guess the two things I got from the breakout session was one, um, how solidly and how well um, these new ideas um, and, and analogies, I guess I'd call them, did, did map on to the uh, MBTI 8 function model. Uh, especially, and the other thing was, uh, I got a sense of how difficult it is for someone who takes like an online short test for uh for the, to find out their mbti how very difficult it is to be to interpret results so if you're new to this um and you think you're interested in it don't read more like go to the myers-briggs mbti website and uh now i'm editorializing sorry i was supposed to just summarize okay. but anyway pay to do the long version and you will be much happier Okay, uh, next one up is uh, Mike. Mike, go ahead. Okay, I, uh, uh, I finally got an understanding of what the axes mean and rationalized how I could be multiple types at one time beside, while uh, depending on how I answered the questions, uh, depending on which hat in my uh, life or, um, or work life, I happened to be wearing at the time, and uh, that was enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next one up is uh, Vincent. Vincent, go ahead. Hi. Uh, two key takeaways. One, y'all are very awesome, and I'll call back to one of Michael's old YouTube videos. I'm looking forward to playing Mega Risk someday. <laughs> A lot of you may not know what he's referring to. <laughs> uh, uh, Go ahead, uh, Mike. Uh, uh, Michael, it's your your floor now. Uh, so, any kind of concluding uh, remarks? We've gone through everybody. So, um, oh, any, any um, kind of concluding thoughts? 
first of all, thank you. It's it's. I'm very glad I could present. I'm glad uh, people enjoyed it. Um, I, I hope uh, those of you who get the book will enjoy that as well. Um, and I, I definitely look forward to our next talk to, to talk more about it. Um, I, I would just leave off by saying, I think the, the thing I, I am always trying to do with my study of typology is um, uh, is to, 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 to see what um, our different psychological biases and prejudices are that naturally come out and to, to realize that there are things to see how other people really do differ from us and how we can transcend that for each other's sake. So anyway, thank you very much. Very Wonderful. appreciative. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. This is uh, just incredible pleasure to have you here and uh, look forward to having you back. Uh, we have uh, put the, the book, uh, URL in there. So please, folks, please get the book and uh, come up with a whole battery of questions. And I just want to tell you what's coming up. The, the big things that we did not cover was the concept of function access, which is like a huge, you know, one of the biggest thing that I learned over like two, three years ago, partly from Michael and from like I think a couple of the people kind of thinking in terms of function access. And then the next step is that of how you know, have the four functional axes um, combine to form these four temperaments and then going into 16 types. And the book does as good a job, if not better, of showing the entire, um, entire range, uh, it could have entire richness of each of the types. So that's what we're going to do uh, next time. So um, really looking forward to that. Again, uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, 